if you just sat through Chris's talk, I'm not going to be as fast. Um, but uh, hopefully, we'll have a good time, and it'll be a little bit lighter and less less uh, less intense. So, um, so yeah, I want to talk about uh, Dialyzer and Elixir and working together with them. Um, so. Uh, some of you may have attended uh, the previous talk in the other room, um, talking about Concur and some of the things related to how, how it works with Dialyzer. Um, so I'm not going to go into a whole big history of what Dialyzer is and where it came from and why it exists, but I'm going to try to show you uh, what it's about and why you might want to use it, how you can use it, and then uh, we'll have some fun stories about how I found bugs in Elixir with Dialyzer. So first of all, what is Dialyzer? Why should you care about it? Uh, first of all, has, has anyone here used Dialyzer with your project? OK, so this is nothing new to you. Uh, if you haven't used Dialyzer with your project, let's learn a little bit. So first, begin with a quick quiz. Did you know that, contrary to some rumors going around, Elixir and Erlang actually have types? Um, there's even guides on them in both the Elixir and the Erlang documentation. So look those up. So if you're using Elixir, uh, you can use these module attributes like at spec and at type. Um, you can define your own types and also specify the types that are used by your functions. And so both the arguments that they take as well as the values that they return. And just like in strong statically typed languages, the types in Elixir and Erlang can help you find bugs. For example, uh, maybe in this first one, your code refers to a type that doesn't exist. Um, or maybe in the second one, it doesn't respect the type of the function that it's calling, uh, or it doesn't match the specification that you gave it. These are all things that can be found uh, with type annotations. However, unlike strong statically typed languages, type annotations are optional. In fact, types in general are optional to your program. Uh, this mean, when I say types are optional to your program, I don't mean they don't exist. Um, I mean that you didn't say anything about them. This does mean you can compile the program even if a type checker that were strict would reject it. This is a good thing because it doesn't make us rewrite all our tools. Um, so that, that is one thing that has been a, a challenge to bringing new, like strongly typed languages to the beam <laughs> is that we have this whole ecosystem of things that won't work with it. Unfortunately, this also means that it's possible to let bugs slip through and make it to production. And this is what Dialyzer is designed to help with, to avoid you know, making these bugs slip through. So luckily, you don't have to be super religious about annotating all of your code. Types can also be inferred by Dialyzer. So um, in this example, I've written a small Elixir module called Inference. Um, and Dialyzer, when it analyzed this module, it, it determined that the function two types returns values with two different shapes. But the function ignore return doesn't care about the result of that function. So it doesn't capture that result in a variable uh, or pattern match on it in a case expression. So all of this was determined without any annotations on the code. Now, there are some things that are in the standard library that you don't see that were already annotated. But given the, the uh, except for very like low level code, um, a lot of that could also be inferred. So you don't have to opt in to annotations, and Dialyzer can still find things. So this is what Dialyzer, and I've used that word like 50 times already, I feel like. Um, but it's an abbreviation of discrepancy analyzer. Okay? So it automates the checking of types in your, in your code after it has been compiled. So what does it do? First, it figures out everything that your code calls from every function that you defined in your app. And from that information, it computes the success typing of your program. And I know that you, if you're familiar with Dialyzer, you probably heard this word. Um, to, to make it fairly simple and, and not so theoretical, uh, the success typing is the collection of types of every value and function call that it can infer about your code, assuming that code has no errors. So another way to put that would be that the type, what types does this code need in order to not crash? in order for it to succeed. OK, so from there, you have the success typing. It can check the success typing against the annotations and other interactions in your code um, against some known classes of errors. And there's a whole bunch of them that you can turn on and off uh, with command line flags. Uh, or if you're calling the dialyzer 
uh, library directly in, in your Elixir or your Erlang code, uh, you can pass them as atoms to turn on and off. Um, so for example, this first one, the behaviors check, determines if modules that declare they implement a behavior actually follow the callbacks that were defined by the behavior, um, and that those callbacks fit the correct uh, types defined. So basically everything in the left column is turned on by default, and there's really not any reason to turn them off. Um, so the right column, on the other hand, has uh, optional warnings that you have to turn on uh, if you want to use them. All of them are okay, uh, but sometimes the warnings can be confusing because they, find, they, they can tend to find some false positives. Um, and they're also, uh, in some cases, a little bit of ar arcane. Now I've put uh, check marks next to three of them uh, that I think are important ones and are related to the bugs I found in Elixir. Um, and so I wanna talk about them more in more detail. So the first one is under specs. Have you ever seen or written a spec like this? <laughs> yes? Okay. Um, this is what under specs will, will warn you about. Is, it, is this spec useful? I don't really think so. It's not useful for documentation. It doesn't help dialyzer at all. Um, so I, typically in this case, I would say if you can't write a good spec, just leave it off. Like, you're, you're not providing any useful information to anybody. And dialyzer will still infer the right type for you. So, um, on the other hand, under specs can also warn you about things that are less objectionable, um, one of which I'll detail later. Uh, but in general, this will help prevent you and your peers from letting bad type specs slip through. Uh, unknown is one that basically most of the tools I've used have turned on. Uh, and it's great because it, it tells you if your code is referring to something, either type or function, that doesn't exist. As far as dialers are concerned, it can't, it can't find it. This may mean you have a typo somewhere. For example, in this, uh, you know, this is the Elixir namespaced module, so map.t is not a type. It's actually the lowercase map, um, which is a built-in type. Uh, another possibility is that you might need to add a dependency to your analysis that you didn't have before. So it doesn't know about some function you're calling, what its type is, um, and, and so it's like, hey, this function doesn't exist. You can also sometimes find those sorts of errors with xref, which is a good tool to, to pull in your tool belt too. Uh, and finally, the, the, the third one I want to talk about is unmatched returns. Uh, this is a bit more controversial, uh, but in my opinion, does uh, encourage you to pay attention to what your functions are, that you call are returning. And this is especially useful in cases where those functions have side effects that might fail. So you're writing to a socket, you're, you're uh, writing to a file, um, you're you know, using some resource that, that may not be uh, as simple as sending a message. Now, the part where this particular warning type um, becomes annoying is when you truly don't care about the result. So for example, in this call to logger, uh, in most times I'm writing a, a call to log message something, uh, send a log message to, the, to a file or to the console, um, I don't really care if the logger handler is running. Um, or if it's actually logging at the particular level that I've, that I've said this is logging at. I just want to send the log message and forget about it. So um, your mileage may vary with this particular warning. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you a little bit that Dialers is a useful tool for your Elixir applications, it finds bugs, so how do we go about using it? Luckily, the members of the community uh, have already made it easy. All three of the libraries I'm going to talk about here provide integration with Mix. So um, if you're on the Erlang side, there's great integration with Rebar 3. You should use that. But we're going to talk about the Mix integrations. So generally speaking, the process of executing an analysis on your code for, with Dialyzer, uh, these, these Mix tasks all do the same thing. They compile the project if it already isn't compiled. Um, and then they check or build PLTs. We'll talk about what those are in a second. Then they do the analysis on your code um, and possibly print warnings that were emitted by Dialyzer and potentially filter. So what, what is this PLT thing? This uh, PLT thing is very core to what Dialyzer does. PLT stands for persistent lookup tables. They're basically the result of doing a success typing analysis by Dialyzer. And then it takes that result and organizes it into an index of basically functions and types to what, the, the, what type they, they uh, point to. You can imagine it uh, looking a bit like this table up here. So why is it important to build PLTs? If you didn't create them, 
ahead of your project analysis, Dialyzer would also have to check all of the code that you call. Um, now this is silly if your dependencies, Elixir and your OTP version, don't change every time you change your code. Uh, so building PLTs of those things before you do your analysis speeds up each individual analysis of your project and you can run it more often. Uh, so it's sort of a, like, uh, compiling your code and it's a, and it's a, in another way of doing that. Okay, so Dialixer is probably the most popular, most mature integration between Dialyzer and Mix. If you search for Dialyzer on HexPM, you'll probably find this one at the top. Um, as a result, a lot of the rough edges of the, the library are already worn off, so you can feel safe using it in basically any project uh, that is in Elixir. It also has a pretty flex flexible and sophisticated set of options for building PLTs, so if you want control over that, it's a pretty good choice. Um, and also, I, th I think it's on an unreleased or a release candidate version of this, but uh, Andrew Summers and some other folks uh, have put a lot of work into making dialyzer warnings friendlier to Elixir developers with a lot more explanation. Um, so uh, this, you know, if you're not familiar with dialyzer's warnings, it can be a bit intimidating at first, so this might be a good way to go uh, to get those. Uh, now, even with those advantages, there are a few things I dislike about it. Uh, caveat, this is just my opinions. By default, uh, transitive dependencies are not included in the PLT construction. I found this a little bit vexing uh, when I first used it. The main reason why I feel like this is problematic is that uh, it could cause certain um, warnings in your application not to be found because it doesn't have the type information for those dependencies that are being called. Um, also, uh, the filtering of warnings uh, is sort of based on what strings Dialyzer emits. Um, or potentially the kind of the warning and, and what file or line it's in. Um, this satisfies most of the cases where you want to ignore a warning that's actually okay to let your build pass, um, but it does limit the granularity of the filtering that you can achieve on, on warnings. So uh, the next one is Dialyze X. It's uh, quite a bit smaller and slightly more opinionated integration than Dialyxer. As such, it uses the strictest set of warnings. So basically, everything that right-hand column I showed you earlier is turned on. Uh, in some cases, this is very annoying. You'll have a lot of warnings emitted in your build. Uh, but it definitely surfaces the maximum number of possible bugs, um, which sometimes with Dialyzer I call misunderstandings. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so when, <laughs> either Dialyzer misunderstands me or I misunderstand it. Uh, it depends on the day. Um, so when it does build the PLTs, uh, it decides that rather than narrowing to the specific applications that your project uses in, to put in those PLTs, uh, either directly or indirectly, like the transitive dependencies, it says, no, I'm going to collect all of the apps of, uh, that are in your OTP install, that are in your Elixir install, and all of your transitive dependencies that you pulled in your project and build that into the PLT. This definitely takes longer than Dialixir's method. Uh, but the built OTP and Elixir PLTs are put in your home directory, and you can reuse them across projects as long as your versions aren't changing. Um, so this greatly cuts down on those unknown type or function errors that you might, might encounter. Uh, and then uh, for filtering warnings, it's based on match patterns. So if you've ever done like et select um, or use et's fun to MS in the, uh, in the shell, you'll be familiar with what match patterns are. Uh, if you haven't, uh, I definitely encourage you to get uh, into them. But uh, it does require you to understand what data Dialyzer returns. But you can get really precise on how granular you want to filter out particular warnings. And then you can also decide that, hey, if I move this function around either into another file um, or to another line in the same file, it's not going to produce a new warning that you have to change the ignore again. So downsides, um, I wrote it. <laughs> if that's a concern for you, maybe it should be. Um, it, it does create big PLTs. Uh, this can be a concern if you're worried about disk space usage. Um, that said, we automated creation of PLTs in our base Docker images that we use in CI. Um, and they, base, they really only add about 10 meg megabytes to the image. Now, that's still like big for a Docker image. Um, but this is only for development and, and continuous integration. We don't ship that. So uh, lastly, of course, it's not very popular in comparison to Dialixer. 
Uh, but because it's pretty stable, I don't push new things to it that often. The last one I want to talk about is Mixed Dialyzer, which is actually not available on Hexpm. I just checked the other day. But uh, this is not really production ready. It was a Google Summer of Code project last year that I helped mentor. Um, it was written by Gabriel Gatu. Uh, he's a student, uh, or was a student in, in Finland. Um, but he's already integrated a lot of the, the Elixir friendly warnings that Die Elixir had. Um, so that's a, that's a good place to start. The, the things I want to highlight from this are a few things he chose to do differently in the design that could be stolen for the other two libraries. Um, first, rather than using the mix project config as a configuration for a dialyzer, there's a separate file. Uh, so similar to the mix formatter, you can say what files you want to format, what sort of other formatting rules you want to import. Uh, he did a similar thing by having um, a separate file. And then second, it has this really, really useful dialyzer info task, uh, which tells you a lot about which warnings are enabled, uh, what they mean, and what applications will be included in your PLTs. Uh, so here, here's a, a quick code sample of what the, his dialyzer EXS file might look like. Um, you know, it's just basically a, a keyword list of all the things. And you can turn on particular apps to in, remove from your analysis or your PLTs and, in, and include. You have a section of warnings that you can ignore, um, warning classes that you can turn on or off. And then he also said, well, maybe you want to include some extra path that's not on your, your code path normally uh, to include some other project. Uh, so that, that's pretty useful to have um, uh, on, you know, separate from the mix file. And then there's the dialyzer info task. So um, it starts off and shows you what, what your application name is, uh, what the Erlang applications it's going to build in that first PLT, um, and then what Elixir applications it's going to build on the PLT on top of that and then all the project applications that you might depend on from whatever layer. Uh, so you get listed everything that's being included in that, and that kind of gives you an idea of how big those things are going to be, as well as what might be missing. And then it goes through um, and talks about uh, all the warnings that are turned on and all the warnings that are ignored and what they basically mean when you counter them. OK, so that's enough about the tools and like why you might want to use Dialyzer. Let's get to the fun part. Uh, which is the chem analysis or bugs I found in Elixir and Dialyzer. And remember, these are possibly misunderstandings, and you'll see why. Um, so the first bug, um, earlier, you know, I mentioned that under specs flag found me some bugs. This is the first one that I found that I really want to talk about. Uh, and again, like I just said, many bugs found by under specs are more misunderstandings. Uh, but to understand why it happens, we need to know about how protocol modules are generated and consolidated. So um, hold on to your butts. OK, so protocols. Who, how many of you have written a proto new protocol in Elixir? OK, a few hands. How many of you have like, implemented a protocol for new data structure? A few more hands. OK, so you, you, when you define a protocol, you're basically making a contract. And then what the Elixir compiler does behind the behind the scenes is figure out all the implementations of that protocol and dispatch to them automatically when you call the generic function. So this is a, a key way to add open-ended polymorphism around your data types. So this is part of the code that gets generated when you call def inside your def protocol. So def protocol defines a module. It undefines the, the kernel def, which defines functions. It's sort of fun. Um, and, and so in this, in this particular macro quotation, uh, it calls kernel def directly to define functions rather than protocol callbacks. OK, so when you define a new callback, uh, this, this code gets generated. Uh, it captures the name of the function and the arity into a module attribute that it uses later, um, and then uh, defines a, a like clause that doesn't dispatch to anything, which is sort of used for the specification in documentation. So that's extracted by the docs tools. And then what it does with the actual implementation is it figures out uh, what the implementation of the particular, um, or the particular implementation for this data type, uh, and then dispatches to that function in that module, uh, passing the arguments. So that's basically how protocols work find the implementation, call that function in that other module. So you, you basically have an overhead of about two function calls for every protocol call. OK. Still with me? 
right? So how do we find the implementation? Uh, so we go down to this info for, so if it doesn't find the implementation, it raises protocol undefined error. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry about the notifications there. I should turn that off. Bye, 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 okay. Uh, so if you've ever had that happen in your code where you pass a, a, a struct or something to a protocol that it's not implemented for, it raises that protocol undefined error. Uh, and then, then the next um, thing it calls is the non-bang version of this function. So it calls impl4, and if it finds it's a struct, so it's pattern matching on that underscore struct field in the map, um, then it'll call this struct impl4, which is the next bit. And in that struct impl4, it constructs a module name, and then says, I is there an implementation for this particular module name? So if we go down to the bottom, we see uh, you know, is this module compiled? Is it loaded into the virtual machine? If so, is, does it have that function exported, this underscore underscore impl function? This particular function is injected when you do def impl. Excuse me. So if it's true, then it calls, uh, give me the target module for, for this. So it calls that underscore impl function. Otherwise, it dispatches to any impl. So if you have fallback to any, it's gonna like use the generic implementation. Okay, woof, that's a lot about how pro protocols work. No die laser yet, what's going on? Um, in addition to that particular set of dispatch code, um, it also generates some, some boilerplate sort of uh, metadata in, embedded in the module uh, that you can call later. So this, um, this is not about specific implementations. This is still in the protocol definition. Okay, so Here's where Dialyzer found the bug or, or misunderstanding. I have a quick look at the specification and the clauses of the function and make a guess at what the discrepancy was. Okay. Everybody have an idea? Okay. If, if you guess that the spec said it could return a Boolean, but it actually only returns false, you're right. Uh, interestingly, after consolidation, this problem still exists, but in the reverse. It'll only return true. Um, so Dialyzer is saying this uh, is not, or this is a super type of the success type. So the success type only contains true or false, depending on consolidation. It doesn't contain both true and false. Okay, so how will we fix this? Is it, again, it's a misunderstanding. Technically, that spec is true. That spec is correct. It's just wider than the spec that was actually successful. Okay, so to fix this, um, the first change was to change the generated specification, so it just says false. Um, but this becomes a problem after consolidation. So consolidation, what it does is it replaces that struct impl4 with individual clauses for every single type that you've defined. And this makes dispatch a lot faster. Um, so during the consolidation phase, it iterates over the protocol module and all of the abstract forms in it and rewrites those things. Um, so we have to go and replace, um, and this is some really intense code that I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on, but we have to go and replace this false, um, see we've sort of ignored what the, the type is, but say, yeah, we consolidated it and we're gonna say that it's true after consolidation. Okay, so. Um, beware a little bit of the Erlang abstract syntax here. It's a little scary, um, but this is basically just a recursive function that, that goes across the entire syntax tree and rewrites that. Now, um, in retrospect, it probably would have been better to just remove the specs entirely and let Dialyzer infer them. Uh, but if I recall correctly, core team wasn't really amenable to that idea um, and uh, nobody really wanted that. They wanted the documentation or something. Okay, on to bug number two. Turns out we got this un sort of underspecification problem again uh, in Elixir 1.5. Um, the fix for this was released in Elixir 1.6. Um, turns out they added a new clause to that underscore protocol function again uh, with imp about implementations of the protocol. So they updated the boilerplate here. Uh, before consolidation, it returns the atom for the impuls. So this is listing out the implementations of this protocol. Um, it returns the atom not consolidated, so at least they didn't make the same mistake as last time. Um, 
so uh, rather than like the union type of not consolidated and whatever it returns after consolidation. Oops, whoa, that went to the end. Give me a second. Okay, so here's how the spec gets changed during consolidation. So this is again a lot of abstract syntax uh, in, in the, the, you know, the Erlang abstract syntax tree. Uh, can you spot the potential under specification problem? I'll give you a hint, it's on the last line. Okay, maybe, maybe that's a bit too much. What if I wrote it like this? Have a, have a quick look at what is being passed as arguments to this function. You got a bunch of variables that are, that are, that are bound in this space. Okay, well, I'm not gonna stump you forever. Yes? If, if there is uh, always non-empty, there is a module? No, that's not the error. Oh. Although that would be interesting. Okay, so, but that, that is an excellent point. This spec says it's a potentially empty list of modules, which would be correct. Um, so here, here's the error, and this, this one gets a little bit hairy. Um, but if you had guessed Dialyzer found not just a list of any module, but a discrete number of modules known at compile time, you were right. Um, notice the last member of this union return type. It lists out the specific modules that implement this protocol. Um, not just any module. So uh, the member of the union type, you know, um, where's the, the, the impuls up at the top, it says consolidated list of any module. At the bottom it says consolidated, and here's a bunch of modules that I know fulfill that type. So it just doesn't match up. Uh, so to fix this bug, we're like, hey, in this scope, we already know what all the modules that implement this thing are, are because we're consolidating. That's like the whole point. Um, so instead of saying it's just the module in a list type, we say it's a list with a union of all of the implementations of this, of this protocol. So in this PR, we also added a test for all this rewrite junk because they're like, okay, if this gets any bigger, we're gonna have to have some, some, uh, uh, some escape hatch for that, prevent regression. Okay, so uh, bug number three. This is the last one. And this one um, I think is a little bit even more twisty, but it's not related to protocols, so we can forget about protocols for a second. And this one's called guard test tuple size can never succeed. Uh, this I did not fix myself, as fixed in a PR by someone else. Uh, and this was released in Elixir 1.8, so you will not see this bug anymore. This is the warning that was emitted by Dialyzer. For a while this bug vexed me because I couldn't find in the code where this tuple size function was called. Uh, didn't exist in any code I wrote. Didn't exist in any code of any dependencies I was pulling in. Uh, however, if we look at the warning, we see there we have some clues about the thing it's trying to match. Um, and that that's supposed to be an elixir struct. You see the underscore underscore struct key in the map. And you also see this exception true uh, key value pair in the map. Um, and this really, this tells us this, this is an elixir exception. So when you do def exception inside a module, um, it'll create a struct and it'll also put this exception true field in the map. So unfortunately I don't have the original file line anymore. I kind of scrubbed it for the, for the bug report. Um, but I was able to trace it down to code that was generated by some macros into the application um, inside the Prometheus libraries we were using. By the way, if you are looking at Prometheus, look at the Prometheus libraries for Erlang Elixir. They're awesome by Ilya Kaparov. Um, really good stuff. So what does it do in this Prometheus Elixir library? Uh, it actually tries not to duplicate the work done in the Erlang library. It just wraps it up. So it delegates implementations of the functions that you might want to call to the plain Erlang library. It depends on. And does through, through this macro delegate. It's basically a thin wrapper around this def delegate that you might have seen um, in Elixir code already. The modification that it does to this delegation is to wrap this call in this with Prometheus error macro, okay? So, so what does that macro do? We're, we're, we're like, uh, like Brian's you know, uh, fantastic voyage. We're going down into the depth of the beast. Um, so in this with Prometheus error macro, uh, it, its job is to intercept exceptions that the base Prometheus Erlang library generated and kind of turn them into Elixir exceptions that are specific for Prometheus. 
So there's this normalize function that happens in the rescue clause uh, that takes whatever uh, Erlang error was emitted and turns it into the Prometheus error. There's some stuff down here that you don't have to care about, about like OTP versions and that stack trace macro. Um, but uh, the, the um, yeah, I'm sorry, I lost my place. Um, so basically, here's a place we're trying to rescue an exception. But the problem is there's still no call to tuple size. Where did that go? Like, there's no tuple size in any of that. OK, so we have to go a bit deeper. And we had to pull out this decompile library. Uh, it was by Michel Mascala. He's one of the members of the Elixir core team. Um, and it lets you spit out the Erlang code that Elixir compiler generates. And so now we're, in, we're looking at Erlang rather than Elixir. I highly recommend you pick up this library if you're ever curious about how Elixir does something. It spells it out in explicit detail um, in Erlang. Um, so anyway, it turns out that when Elixir grabs these, these Erlang exceptions into the rescue clause, it generates a try catch with two clauses that try to normalize that and turn it into those Elixir structs. OK, so this is the second version of that where it says, oh, it's already an exception. So we're catching it. We're, it's already an exception. And the exception type is Elixir Erlang error. So that's where we get the, if, we go, if I go back a uh, slide, that's where we get this E in Erlang error. It's saying that's that, that type of exception. OK, and then it calls Elixir's exception normalize. And um, deep inside this, um, so we can, we can see that this exception uh, value is pattern matched out into this underscore three generated variable. And then down below, there's a case expression on that underscore at three. And then it matches out, say, into a variable underscore at five when tuple size at five equals two. And also element one of underscore tuple, yeah, okay, bad key. Anyway, so here's our tuple size. Um, so it's, it's trying to check the length of this if it's a tuple um, and if it happens to be the bad key exception. OK, the, the problem here is it can never be a tuple. Why could it never be a tuple? We've already matched it as a map up when we bound it to underscore at three. So it can never be a tuple. So tuple size will always fail. Um, that's where the, the warning comes from. Guard test, tuple size can never succeed. Incidentally, you see these, some, other, some other guards here. And in, if you're not familiar with Erlang, you can use semicolons to separate parallel possible uh, guards. So like these is sort of like a logical or. Um, so these other two clauses in the, in the guard would never succeed either. It's just that it hit this one first, and it says, hey, that's, that's not going to work. So um, we already know this is a map. We should, we're calling tuple size on it. This is not actually that big of a problem because, uh, t because guard functions are allowed to fail, to crash, and they don't cause the entire code to crash. They just cause that clause to be, to be skipped. Now, I didn't, again, I didn't end up fixing this one myself. Uh, various reasons. I, I don't remember why. I think I didn't know how to proceed. Is deep in the Elixir code generator. Um, or maybe I didn't have the time. That's very possible. Anyway, uh, Glauber Campino <laughs> fixed this in PR 8196. The decision they made in this PR was to mark all this code as generated um, in the abstract form. So every, every, every branch of the, the syntax tree has metadata about it. And you can say, hey, this, this code is generated. Now, this doesn't actually remove the failing guard test. <laughs> uh, so it's sort of a cheat. Uh, but again, like I said, since guards that crash actually evaluate to false, um, there's no harm done at runtime. So it's completely safe. And with that marked as generated, Dialer says, hey, there's no problem anymore. anymore. I'm going to ignore it. OK, so in conclusion, Dialer is a useful tool for checking your code. You should use it. It's not too hard. We've got some nice integrations with Elixir now. Um, we didn't when I started using Elixir. And you can find bugs in Elixir, just like I did. It's not too bad. So thank you. Um, you can find my presentation slides there. I should have made a short URL, I realize now. I'm sorry. Um, but it's just chemanalysis dialyzing Elixir. So thank you. Happy to take questions. Any questions?
Hi. Hi. Do you aim to have zero dialyzer warnings in your code base? I definitely like to. Um, there are some times when it's just not feasible. So um, you can see that from these bugs that I found, there was a delay between when I found them and when they got actually released in Elixir. So there's a time where you just kind of have to keep those filters um, in your project. Uh, but yes, it's, it's great if you can. Um, on the other hand, there's also some times that you will have false positives found. Um, Dialyzer will never give you false negatives. If it finds something, it's pro it could be a problem. Um, but uh, sometimes it's not something to be concerned about. So. And, and as part of like your CI process, mm -hmm. do you check for that? Yes, as part of the CI process, we do run uh, the mixed dialyzer task. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Brujo. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so co coming from Erlang, mm -hmm. I, I see your libraries have uh, ignores for Um, you know, it's just a module attribute, so you can still do that. Um, the downside of doing that is it may ignore new warnings that you introduce. So I, I tend to prefer the, the match pattern thing, and I can go, I can drill in on what the specific warning is I want to ignore. And if you use the attribute, you have to write it in Erlang style, like with tuples and atoms. Yeah, atom it's not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> you do have to write it in tuples and whatnot, but it's not so bad. So I'm using uh, Dialixer. Sure. Um, is there a way to emulate what you were talking about in your library uh, where you get all of OTP? Because we have a lot of unknown warnings, and so we've just turned off unknown. Yeah. Um, what you can do is, and I've done this before, you can go into where your OTP is installed, do an ls, use awk to scrape off the version numbers, and then use that as your input list for all of your the applications to include in the PLT. Do that with Elixir too, but there's only like five apps, so it's not a big deal. And somehow put all those files into your Dialixir config? Yes. Well, Except they're the just name. directory names. So you're just saying, what is the OTP app that I want to include? Okay. It's a little bit troublesome, and actually there's, there's sort of a hack in DialyzeX where it says, hey, at this point in time, I knew these were all the bundled apps in OTP, so I'm just gonna make a list in the module um, and if it doesn't find them, it just omits them from the PLT. Um, so that, that kind of came with a thing where uh, when they upgraded and they removed all of that Corva stuff that came, used to come with OTP, that it's like, hey, I don't know about this app, don't know about this app, don't know about this app, don't know about this app. But it still builds everything else. Any other questions? All right. All right. Thank you, Sean. Thank you.